Hello? So this being an economics talk, you, you must understand that there's no such thing as a free lunch by now. And uh, although in this case, maybe it'll be an enhancement rather than a cost listening to the following uh, talk. So the Financial Economics Institute at Claremont McKenna College is very pleased to sponsor today's lunchtime talk by Professor Gordon Phillips. And before I go on, I'm supposed to thank Professor Joshua Rosette who decided not to be here, but instead spent time in Portland where it is raining and it is not 100 degrees. Uh, but they're very, back to what I was talking about, Gordon Phillips from the University of Southern California titled The Need for Industrial uh, Organizational Foundations in Corporate Finance and Asset Pricing. Professor Phillips is the Charles E. Cook Community Bank Chair and Professor of Finance at the Marshall School of Business at USC and he was previously on the faculty at the University of Maryland, received his PhD from Harvard University back during the Pleistocene. He is a member of the National Bureau of Economic Research as well. Since 2009, he's been the academic director of the Financial Management Association and is currently an associate editor of the Review of Corporate Financial Studies. He's also served as an associate editor of several other finance journals. He's published more than 20 papers, several of which have won research awards, including the Best Paper Award from the Financial Management Association. Much of his recent work focuses on the interaction between industrial organization and financial market decisions, and that's the topic of his talk today. Anyone familiar with basic finance models will recognize that competitors in an industry are often treated as benchmarks for the purposes of both project valuation and performance evaluation. But this perspective fails to account for the endogeneity of these benchmarks due to competition within an industry, competition that can have profound effects on firm value. In his talk, Gordon will explain in detail the economic consequences of one way that firms compete with each other through their financial policies. I'd like to help you all to help me welcome Gordon to the Athenaeum. Well, thank you very much, Eric, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and I would say in sunny California, but I'm coming from sunny California, but it's still a pleasure to be in sunny California. Um, you know, when I was thinking about this talk, it was a, it's a little unusual, and since we have a, a large blend of uh, people here, including uh, we've got quite a few undergraduates, we've got some master's students in, in economics and finance, and we've got also this uh, academic finance conference, which is running. So I was trying to think, uh, you know, this is hard to please all these audiences. And then I also thought, well, you know, it's interesting here. What's distinctive about uh, Claremont McKenna and the Robert Day School is its focus on economics and finance, uh, whereas a lot of places these are really kind of separated. In fact, you have the Department of Economics, which can be in a wholly separate building from the finance department over in a business school. And so this is very unique. And so I got my, uh, my undergraduate and my PhD are both in economics. And then the question becomes, well, why did I go work in a business school? Then is one question you might answer. And then by the end of my talk, maybe you can, you can come up with a, a reason for that. I want to talk about something which is if you, if you do finance research and you look at people in finance, a lot of times they do ignore the industrial organization, which is a topic which hopefully a lot of you have been exposed to in your, already in your coursework at uh, Claremont McKenna and the Robert Day School. So the focus, if, we, if you take some of, some of your finance courses, and a lot of the focus in, in, in finance is on, you know, we talk about different problems, and then we see how finance interacts with those problems. And these can be, focus, you know, agency problems in finance, well, let's see, but I got it. There we go. Pricing of risk, asymmetric information, and not market coordination problems. So, in economics uh, departments, of course, they worry about market coordination as one of the big issues and markets there. But when we go over to the finance department, a lot of times they say, well, we worry about the problems between, you know, how do we price securities? What is the pricing of risk? What are agency problems, you know, between managers and shareholders when you have to hire a, a, a separate agent? And then there's also a problem of asymmetric information where, you know, basically investors have to extract, you know, fundamental information from firms and they're not sure what that, what the implications of that asymmetric information are. And they kind of, in, mo in most cases, ignore market coordination problems or industrial organization. The central port point I'll be making is that cash flows, which are the focus of the above central problems, because we still run discounted cash flow models, 
are fundamentally affected by product market competition in industrial organizations. So in, in many cases, we cannot ignore uh, the, the market structure of an industry. Traditional finance, in, for example, let me go a little bit more, in asset pricing, prices are determined by firms' risk relative to aggregate benchmarks. Firms' risk characteristics are typically viewed as independent of the action of competitors. In corporate finance, we, ask, we investigate the failure of the Medigliani-Miller proposition. So if you haven't yet had your finance uh, course on Medigliani-Miller, I know some, we do have some freshmen here. That is a very famous uh, Medigliani-Miller uh, proposition. And that real and financial decisions are independent, but it's set up as a way to say, well, they're only independent under certain conditions. And they give you a set, set of conditions which we don't believe hold in the real world. So then people investigate, of course, the impact of the failure of these conditions. And that's what a lot of people in finance uh, wor worry about. Corporate governance, uh, which deals with uh, CEOs and the, and the corporate boards, is a big topic also in finance. And you'll hear, see a lot of uh, studies on corporate governance. You know, why do powerful CEOs and poor boards survive if they destroy value? It's kind of an interesting question, because we can think of, in the press, you see all this, all this, uh, you know, articles about how CEOs might be overcompensated and so forth. And so this is the idea of corporate governance. We're looking at why the market mechanism may break down, or at least break down for a short period of time. Now, the real question is, well, most of these topics ignore the industrial organization of markets. So, and if you think of the type of problems, there's the kind of things which we as academics deal with. We say, well, certain capital structures affect real decisions. So this would be a, uh, a violation of the Medigliani-Miller proposition. Like the amount of debt might affect the uh, risk of an invested be investment because of a risk shifting problem. Because you're going to ignore the downside states. So if a shareholder makes a decision, you might take a riskier decision, right? The amount of debt might affect the level of investment through a debt overhang problem. These are two typical situations. But the implication is many of these cases are kind of partial equilibrium, or there's some inefficiencies which allow these problems to become manifest given recontracting costs. Another typical problem we deal with are contracting problems or selection problems given asymmetric information. Signaling, we have mechanisms to think how firms might be able to separate themselves. If you're a good firm with good investment opportunities, Maybe you could take a financial structure which might tell you something, tell the outsiders, hey, this is a good firm, so you should believe me that it's a good firm. But these give rise to investment inefficiencies, and what we do in finance is think about can these investment inefficiencies be solved or partially solved with a set of optimal financial contracts, either back to the first best or in many cases to a second best. That that's the best we can do given the problem, so there's going to be some inefficiency in the system left over even after we choose the best financial contract. Now, here's where my, the topic of my talk comes in. There's benchmarking involved in this. Because in many cases, even if you go to investment banking, you always have come up with a set of peer firms. Okay, my peer firms do X. So whatever we do, we have a set of benchmarking. And it's typically assumed firms interact but they, without considering the actions of their rivals. So if I take a benchmark, and I say, well, Coca-Cola has a certain financial structure, and then Pepsi-Cola has another financial structure. And the question might be, well, maybe I should, Coke would say, okay, I look at Pepsi to get some idea of what I might choose, or maybe this is also true in the technology space. They say, well, I'm going to you know, look at what my rivals are doing. And the question is why. But you know, what you want to do in any kind of benchmarking is you also want to evaluate whether or not you've underperformed or overperformed against your benchmarks, right? So you can think of a, uh, a manager evaluated for his firm performance, and the central idea is, to have they outperformed the competitors in that industry, right? So where does the industrial organization come in? Because, you know, finance typically treats competitors as benchmarks which out th without thinking about how the actions of competitors themselves may impact me as a firm. So it's just a benchmark, right? We also benchmark performance with other firms, both in corporate finance and asset pricing. So Larry Summers, who's a pretty uh, famous uh, financial economist, uh, his critique is that finance, so he's an economist, he's not a financial economist, let me back up. His critique is that finance is catch-up economics. And catch-up economics says, well, you know, in finance we think about, well, is this, is, are, what is the price of two bottles of catch-up? And they say, well, first you look at the bottle of one bottle of catch-up and you say, well, it should just be double. Otherwise, we have an arbitrage opportunity. Well, economics, economists sometimes take issue with that because they, we don't really typically explore what the pi price of the first bottle of ketchup is. 
And again, thinking about this kind of uh, interaction is we're trying to think about how even fundamentals might determine, what fundamentals may determine even the first bottle of ketchup. Okay, so what we're gonna do performance relative to industry benchmarks kind of uh, misses a bigger issue. So what drives the industry benchmark? One can try to understand what in general are the supply and demand factors which give rise to the first bottle of ketchup and see if the first bottle of ketchup is priced correctly. Now, industrial organization, it's, it's how firms interact with each other that's important. And firms take actions to impact this interaction, which, of course, impacts their performance. And we know in antitrust, people are all worried about mergers and acquisitions because they're worried, well, maybe the consumer prices will be affected. So if a firm A buys its competitor, firm B, this has an action which affects the actual fundamental price. We might see this in the airline industry, for example, right? So it's not just a relative basis they have. You have to think about what, in fact, the competitor is going to be doing and what, it, what the impact is. And in industrial organization, they have a structure which they call the structure, conduct, and performance. And this was the traditional way that IO industrial organization viewed firms. Structure was exogenous. You had a monopoly, oligopoly, or perfect competition. And then you looked at the conduct, which would be pricing and quantity. The interaction between firms would be, that's a, a, a Bertrand or Corneau. And then you look at the performance, which is the cash flow outcomes. There's been a bit of revolution in, in, in industrial organization, which is now making its way into finance as well. And that dynamics are important. The structure is important. I might take actions to produce a monopoly. I might take actions which influence the structure. My pricing decisions, if I back up here, are viewed here as the second stage, conduct, pricing, decisions, but I might make those decisions to impact the structure itself. And then the question is, you know, again, I take actions to impact the structure with an aim to impact performance. So I want to impact my performance by buying a competitor or maybe change the pricing to try to drive the competitor out of business. And there's been a large literature in, in economics which has explored these topics. And you know, firms invest in R&D and advertise, for example, to differentiate themselves and create barriers to entry. But structure may, of course, impact the range of conduct possible. So it's a central point. Now, the question is, well, how, what does this have to do with finance? Okay, we're talking about the interaction of finance and industrial organization. Well, firms may change their capital structure so they can gain an advantage in the product markets is one implication. So, and we're gonna explore this in other implications as well. And what I have come up with, as I said myself, well, you know, we've traditionally viewed the industrial organization and economics being a somewhat separate from, uh, from uh, fin finance. So what I've done is come up with a set of five conditions in the spirit of Midigliani-Miller. I call it the Midigliani-Miller for competition in finance. So I'll give you five conditions under which we don't have to worry about industrial organization. Right, where we say, okay, industrial organization is something finance people don't have to worry about, and they can be viewed as separate from the economics. Now, you can, we'll see that these conditions are probably violated in real life. So the implication is going to be that we do need to worry about the industrial organization when we look at financial decisions. So here's the, I think we need the equivalent of Midigliani-Miller for competition in financial decisions. And then I could say competition doesn't infect the interaction of finance and real side decisions under the following conditions. So condition number one, I'm gonna have five conditions. Condition number one is that financial structure of firms can be costlessly adjusted. Because and if, 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 it cannot be, and if it can be costlessly adjusted, then we cannot be used as a commitment device differentially in competitive and concentrated industries. A commitment device is something where I say, well, I'm gonna take a lot of, uh, a lot of, I'm gonna have a lot of extra cash and very little debt because then I'm going to be able to lower my prices to drive you out of business, right? That would be an implication. Now, the question is, when might that not hold? Well, only if it's credible that, you know, somebody else won't, start, won't, won't step in and provide money to you. And secondly, if it's credible that I will actually take this action and that you won't, be able to, you won't be able to get alternative, again, sources of finance. Well, you know, if it turns out, if I look at this, research has shown that financial structure can be used as a commitment device to increase price and decrease output. So this is an, one thing is, is used a lot of times in, in, in leveraged buyouts, which are very popular, 
is that the company taking over the private uh, public company will in fact raise price substantially. So the question is why were they able to do that? Well, they're able to do that because again, and the competitor will believe they were because if they take on a lot of debt, they have to increase their cash flow payments in order to cover that debt. And as long as I can't recontract and, and adjust the capital structure, then my rival says, well, I know, uh, for example, if I was that company, I know that I, that company is not going to cut prices. You know, they're, they're going to need these cash flows. They're not going to cut prices. So I know that the other, the other firm is, is going to say, well, they're going to behave less aggressively. So in my equilibrium, I'm going to behave less aggressively too. So prices might increase. Now, in fact, you could do the opposite situation where you say, well, this firm with lots of debt needs to price aggressively. And they want to try to drive, you know, because the stockholders are going to try to take advantage of the bondholders. It turns out that's an empirical question, which I think we've settled, where indeed the highly leveraged firms price less aggressively in the product market in these kind of concentrated industries. But notice I said in the concentrated industries, because it's in those industries in which there is a commitment device and a signaling mechanism to the competitor of what you're going to do. And it has to be a credible signal because, again, otherwise they're not going to believe that you're going to take this action, which might not normally be in your best interest. Then the, the second condition is that firms can adjust their physical capital stock similarly in all industries. This would be adjustment in, you know, the, the, I can move up and down my physical capital stock when in, in, when in response to a negative demand shock. So if there's a recession that occurs, will I be able to change my physical capital stock? Or if I get in desperate, can I sell my physical capital stock to someone else? And there's an older paper here by Schleifer and Vishny that's very, pop, very prominent, which explores the conditions on where that's not true. Because again, if your competitors are also in financial distress, they're not going to have the money to buy your physical capacity. So it might be sold outside of the industry. So this is the idea of asset liquidity being quite important. But if you notice, asset liquidity is going to be dependent upon how many other firms are in the industry. So differences in adjustment costs can cause risk factors to be different in competitive and concentrated industries. And this has been explored by Ho and Robinson and also a recent paper by Volta when it looks at debt. And a, a, a number of other papers, including one of mine that was published last year, which shows that liquidity differences and equity costs can vary with the amount of product market competition. So again, if you have an active market for your assets and you get into distress, and an active market means many potential buyers, you're going to be offered by equity holders perhaps a, a, a equity at a more reasonable rate, so your equity cost of capital is going to be lower. Again, so the cost of capital that we use to discount cash flows is going to be dependent upon the concentration and the competitive interaction within industries. Condition three, that firms can gather information about the optimality of the investment, which may depend on the rivals, costlessly or equally at least, in competitive or concentrated industries. So does the amount of product market competition actually impact the cost of gathering information is a question that we explore. And you know, one says, well, stock prices can equally reflect fundamentals in competitive and concentrated industries. There's recent work, which won a Best Paper Award in the journal Finance by Perez, which shows this not to be the case. There's actually a difference in the information gathering costs in competitive versus concentrated industries. So again, we cannot, and this impacts the ability to issue securities at differential prices. And then I have a paper uh, in the Journal of Finance as well that year, which also explores how the competitive and concentrated industries impacts information gathering costs. Turns out in competitive industries, you can say, well, you, you have a lot of information can be gathered about rivals. But again, there's a problem is because you have many firms. But the problem is, of course, you've got many firms to gather that information. So in a monopolist, you have actually few firms to gather information. So it's a little easier to get firm-specific information versus market-specific information. Now this, in the Perez paper, he explores how this might create mispricing and actually inefficient investment in, in fact, in competitive industries vis-a-vis -vis concentrated industries. And I just have a couple slides just to give an in, in, uh, you know, some intuition of how these kind of papers proceeds. In this Perez paper, for example, 
he looks at product market imperfections and do they spread to equity markets? And he has a kind of paper here which shows stock price informativeness. And if you notice, he's got market power, which I've circled in red. And, and you'll see that market power, meaning again, you have more concentration, is, a, is associated with increases in measures of stock price informativeness. So this is not just corporate finance, it's also asset pricing which we can see that this would impact how efficiently assets are priced uh, in competitive vis-a-vis -vis concentrated industries. Uh, so, uh, in my paper as well, we looked at industry booms and busts, and we actually said, are outcomes predictable in these kind of competitive versus concentrated industries? And we're looking at predictability in kind of an interesting way because we're looking at predictability in the stock market. And we said, does competition matter? And are outcomes different in competitive or concentrated industry for investors? And we had some evidence here. Uh, again, I'm not going to go into the specific details, but what you found is that there, if industries raised lots of investment or lots of, of new financing, and they're more likely to do this in competitive industries, that we found that shareholders had negative ex post returns, which is kind of a stock market anomaly. You know, again, this is one of the things we do in asset price. They do in asset pricing is now is to see if, in fact, returns are predictable. And then, secondly, can you get this kind of excess return or an excess alpha? Now, of course, the big the big issue here is maybe there's some omitted risk factor, and so we explore that in the paper and don't come up with any natural candidates for omitted risk factor to explain these excess alphas. Condition four is firms take their actions of their rivals as given. I think in many cases that's not going to be the case. Because, but that's what we assume in, in many cases when you write down a net present value. And that the risk of the investment doesn't depend on the rivals. And that I just do a net present value and I do it pretty much similarly. I calculate the betas and so forth, come up with a discount rate. But we don't really take into account the actions of the rivals directly. But, and then this actually has an implication. There's no races to invest, no strategic investment where I invest more to preempt my competitor from investing. And there's many models in economics which talk about these kind of races to invest. Or again, investing more partially just to make sure that you invest less as a competitor. So this would, should be built into a net present value model. There's a large literature on real options which shows competition matters in calculating what the value of real options are and the value of what investment decision is. So uh, this is pretty, pretty well explored. Mergers and product market synergies are also something which you say, well, they should depend on, in fact, product market competition. But in many cases, when we read the corporate finance literature, a lot of cases they do not actually take into account the actual competitiveness of the industry. Now, this is assumed perhaps that you know, some industry fixed effect or some industry general thing can sweep this out. But it does not necessarily sweep this out because, again, if you think about it, the actions themselves, which can influence the, the viability of a merger, can actually depend upon whether it's a competitive industry or a concentrated industry. And industrial organization, we've got large antitrust divisions in the EU and the, and the Department of Justice, which basically evaluate mergers and their effect on consumers. But in most cases in the finance literature, we ignore the product market competition aspect to a large extent. And we show, I have a paper here which shows that in fact, these product market synergies or some of the gains in product markets do vary with industry competition. So here we, we, you know, the question is how do you measure synergies? They're difficult. How do you measure competition? It's difficult to measure. And these are kind of operational questions. And, you know, competition itself can affect how the gains are shared between parties in the merger. One could think of, again, a target industry. If, I'm, if there's a target firm here that has lots of potential buyers, then the target is going to get a larger fraction uh, of, the, of the gains because acquirers are going to bid to actually buy that asset. You know, a recent example would be Google buying the traffic software if you drive around LA called Waze. It's very useful software because it can get you around from point A to point B. Now the question is, well, Google paid $1.3 billion for a company which had virtually no profits. Why is Google paying $1.3 billion for this company? Well, there's two things. One, 
is they get some spillover benefits in advertising, right, on their platform. By now you're using this other software uh, on your iPhone or your Android phone. The second big benefit that they did is, and why they paid so much, is because they had a bit of a bidding war with some other potential buyers. And so they bought it, I think, also to keep it out of their competitors' hands because Yahoo wanted to buy it, Apple wanted to buy it, and a few other companies. So, of course, if you're the owners of this uh, software, which is almost just a patent almost and a little bit of software, you're going to shop it around to get the best price. And you're gonna, the more potential buyers there are for that product which you've developed, the better price you're going to get. And that's kind of the implication. That, do, that depends directly on the product market competition that's involved in these industries. And this would imp it impacts, of course, if you're starting up a new entrepreneurial company, you might, not, you might want to think about who you might be able to sell it to as well and how many potential buyers there are for that product even before you start investing all of your time. Because in many cases, you may, you may end up selling to a large firm instead of actually developing the software and going public yourself. So this is a topic we explored, and we identified competition. I'm not going to go into the details of this, but we did it with some text-based analysis where we could identify competitors and potential buyers. And one, here's an example of uh, some mergers we identified in this paper. Well, General Dynamics was a large military company. Well, they bought a company called Antheon, and Antheon was a company which developed missile guidance software. But according to traditional industry definitions, well, these are separate industries, but they're not, right? Because it's missile, missile guidance software, which is used by General Dynamics. So they sold for a nice price. Those two in the green were the firms which merged, or basically General Dynamics bought Antheon. So mergers can create these... Now, why did General Dynamics buy? Because there's some relationship there. They can create synergies. But they also perhaps bought it to keep it out of Lockheed Martin's hands. And Lockheed Martin also has missiles, and they have guided software and so forth. And, you know, this is a way to keep the software proprietary for General Dynamics. Uh, something close at home in the movie industry. I thought you'd get an example of uh, one that would work really well. Disney bought Pixar. So Disney we all know. Pixar we also should all know as well because that's the one that uh, you know, uh, Steve Jobs was also involved in uh, previous to going back to Apple. And you know, the, the implication there was, well, why did Disney buy Pixar? Well, other companies could have bought Pixar too. So there's some competitive angles there. But they also allowed them to go into digital making of new of new, um, new products. So it's the product market side. Now, we had some ideas. We looked at merger announcement returns and some out, out, real-term outcomes. In general, the point of these tables was saying is that, and there were synergies, it did depend upon the competition. So we had some measures of competition. So the merger outcomes depended upon the measures of competition. And we found, again, those companies which which had a reduction in competition, or actually when they bought things were more similar to themselves, experienced better merger outcomes. And again, the, the, the conclusion of the merger paper was that synergies and competition matter. And merger pair similarity, is, while high, is quite heterogeneous. The best mergers, and I've done a lot of work on mergers, should be ones with higher exposed cash flows and new product introductions. Well, how do you identify those? They're similar acquirer and target, and also targets that are farther away from the acquirer's nearest rivals, so you could differentiate yourself from the existing competition. They have unique, hard-to-replicate assets <coughs> that make potential new products possible. Because there's lots of mergers which don't succeed. So one of the goals we do in academia is try to understand, okay, what makes for a successful merger? What makes some mergers more successful than others? And so we're identifying, you know, competition is one of those factors. The last condition is that agency problems are not affected by competition. Now, remember what agency problems are is when you have a separation of the shareholders and the CEO or the management, or you might have a separation of, of, bond, of, of equity and debt. And in this case, we think these are affected by competition. In fact, people have shown in compensation is affected by competition. So a recent paper by uh, Giroux and Mueller shows that corporate governance is affected by competition. In that paper, we'll see that I have a few slides on it. We think I'm going to skip in the interest of time. But what happened is in a, in, a, in a competitive industry, well, that helps discipline the managers. They can't make as many decisions that are not in the best interest of shareholders or best interests of the firm because this could impact firm survival. But in a very concentrated industry, there are more rents. So in this case, the managers could extract a higher portion of the rents for themselves 
the implication they dealt with was what about the mer market for corporate control? Couldn't the mergers discipline the managers? So if a merger comes along, and wouldn't that be more likely that uh, this, this would be a mechanism where the manager knows I'm going to lose my job if someone buys me, if I misbehave or if I extract too many rents. Well, they used a change in the business combination law to show that when merger likelihood went down, managers extracted more rents out of the firm. So this was a direct implication is there's no longer this external mechanism, so managers were able to extract more rents, but only in the concentrated industries. So again, the industry concentration impacted the effectiveness of corporate governance and the ability for managers to extract rents. So this is a bit of their paper, and you can see the big thing was this BC was a business combination law, and the Herfindahl index is HHI, which is a measure of competition, and they showed that the return on assets after the business combination law went down in very concentrated industries because and they had some additional evidence which shows the managers were able to extract more rents. So we have a new paper, and this will be the last thing I'll show you, about when are powerful CEOs beneficial. You know, literature to date, powerful CEOs are costly. Empirical evidence suggests negative consequences, a negative performance sensitivity of CEOs compensation to turnovers, which means that CEOs are just paid irrespective of their performance. Um, and this is bad. If you have a powerful CEO, this was more like, you know, again, you'd have this more likely. Negative stock returns if you have a powerful CEO after M&A. Implication is the powerful CEO got some private benefits from the merger, so did the acquisition. They're more likely to commit fraud, powerful CEOs. Maybe Volkswagen is a very powerful CEO. We're not sure if he was involved but in this recent fraud, but there's a lot of impl implications. A lot of papers which shown powerful CEOs are more likely to commit fraud. They're less likely to be detected. And, they're, and they also have less accounting profitability, and they have ne negative industry-adjusted Tobin skew. So the question is, that's a measure of a value. Uh, and the question is, well, why do we even have powerful CEOs then, right? So all the literature said all this negative benefits of powerful CEOs, and these are all the papers. So we have some recent paper that for, there are some benefits of powerful CEOs, and powerful CEOs are beneficial in more competitive product markets. But unlike the Giro and Mueller, we, we show they had to take an active role instead of just passively in, in competitive industries just extracting less surplus. They hold fewer board meetings. That might not, you might say, well, that's bad, but they, basically it can be good because it allows a firm to react efficiently to product market changes and threats. So in these industries which have lots of change going on with more competition, you may want a more powerful CEO because you don't want to have to mess with the bureaucracy of having to get the board to clear everything. And then the question is, well, how does product market competition impact things? But again, it's because these markets are rapidly changing, there's more product market competition. So in rapidly changing competitive product markets, CEO power has a positive impact on the value of the firm. So we can say, well, we don't want to have a powerful CEO in a kind of a stable monopoly or stable uh, in product market where there are lots of rents because he may be able to extract more rents. But in these rapidly changing product markets, it may be beneficial to have a powerful uh, a powerful CEO. And so here's an example, and I'm almost to the end, of a very powerful CEO, and I like to give this example where he was kicked out of Apple originally, fired, and they brought in a different CEO, and the board kicked him out, so the board had more power, and in this case, he was only willing to come back and rejoin Apple and create the iPhone and other things that he did before he passed away if he actually, in the contract, was granted more power. So we could say, well, it's part of its ability, but he was the same ability in both cases. But in the first case, he was kicked out by the board, so the board wasn't stupid. They said, well, to get him back, and he wouldn't go back without more power, and it was a great decision for Apple to hire Steve Jobs back. And they gave him a lot of power to do whatever the heck he wanted because it's a rapidly changing competitive market. They didn't have to worry as much about uh, extraction of private benefits. There are some research possibilities. How do you get, or possibilities you should be thinking about your career? How do you give advice to managers? You can say, well, if you're in a very competitive or a concentrated industry, you might come up with, well, you should understand which financial securities should you use to finance your investment. It's not innocuous what you choose based on the competitive environment. So in the end, here I'll summarize. The, my talk is to say is that competitors are not just benchmarks. And that's a lot of times what people do. They do benchmark analysis. Firms choose financial pol policies. They should and they do choose financial policies to interact, intera to influence interaction with each other. 
So my point is industry competition is not just a control variable on alternative disciplining device. Competition is a fundamental state variable which impacts the viable governance structures, viable compensation systems, and viable financial structure, and the risk and survival of firms. So if we're interested in these questions as finance or economics uh, researchers or practitioners, we need to take into account, you know, again, the fundamental industry competition. So that's the, uh, the end of my talk. Thank you very much. So I understand there's is time for questions or is that what you I understand, Eric, or not? Yes. There are some metrics that we use, and things would be like, does the CEO also have, is also chairman of the board? And the other thing we do is we look at how many directors the CEO actually appoints during his tenure, that's called soft power, versus ones that he inherited or are forced upon him. And a third measure would be how many outside directors there are. So this is a big topic in corporate governance. Now, in order to develop, first you have these indicators, and you can do zero one indication, so just compare those with the CEO as the chairman and has a, and also the CEO, and then with those he's a separate role. And then the others you could do some kind of weighting mechanism, like a number of directors appointed would be a number from zero to, you know, N, where N is the total number of directors on the board. So this way you get these kind of ordinal measures of CEO power. So they're not going to be continuous measures, but it'd be, again, discrete measures of CEO power, and then you just compare those with high CEO power to low CEO power. So I'm just curious, Gordon, so uh, when you're saying that right now there's a separation between maybe finance and competition, so in the legal, kind of in the regulation sphere, so with the DOJ, do you anticipate that these you know, lawyers there should now start caring about antitrust stuff? Well, uh, they like actually that? have started, and I was, uh, one of the things we do as economics is we sometimes act as expert witnesses, but I was called in by the DOJ, and they were basically deciding whether or not in the case of a, of a spin-off by a company, should this, com should this competitor be allowed to buy it? So it was, a, it was a restructuring decision. But they typically, and then another case, they were actually looking at the financial structure, and then they said, well, should the competitor be able to buy it given the competitor has so much debt they couldn't be an effective competitor? So they're looking at these, but it's probably not primary to their, um, uh, you know, what they do typically. But one of the guidelines that they have actually have instituted is if, a, if you have a merger you want approved, in many cases they require you to d divest assets by some of, the, some of the assets in markets in which there are localized concentration. And they want to make sure you divest them to a financially stable buyer. So you can't just pick some, some patsy to buy the assets. So they've actually explicitly do this now. But typically, they, 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 in many cases, they don't. But now they're starting to see more. So you started off with five conditions under which um, you know, finance doesn't have to worry about IO and economics. And I, I think you argued pretty well for each of those five conditions. Is there? an industry or an area where you think that all five conditions apply so that finance can work in and of itself? I tend to think that uh, you, in basically most industries you have to consider the fundamental economics. And the real question is do you, do you just look at, do you treat it as a competitive industry? But many asset pricing models now actually have fundamentally this is a perfectly competitive industry. And you look right there is written. And then we develop all the implications for asset pricing. And so right there I would take exception. Now, there are some competitive industries. So if you're going to write a model down for competitive industries, then you've got to, you have to give us at least some indication of how many industries you think it might apply for. 
So there probably are some industries that are very competitive where you can lose aggregate information. You don't need to know necessarily what all the rivals are doing. And, you know, again, this varies by industry. So one could think of some industries, you know, where you've got tons of uh, firms out there and you can probably separate those. Maybe the retail industry, you've got tons of firms, potential rivals. So you don't have to worry about managers taking too much money out of the firm. You don't have to worry about many of these other conditions. But it's still going to be relatively uh, few industries, although there may be many firms in retail. One last question. Any questions? If not, I'd like you to join me again in thanking Gordon Phillips for coming down and talking about it. Thank you.